Welcome to worship. We will be sharing the cookie trays with our homebound members again this Valentine's Day. So if you have cookies, sugar-free or regular, please bring them to church by February 3rd so the trays can be prepared. Second, our annual meeting will be held on Sunday, February 28th at noon on Zoom. That's the annual meeting part two. We'll hear the annual report and elect a nominating committee. Two blood drives coming up the 26th of February and the 26th of March. If you're able to donate, that would be great. The council elected officers a couple of weeks ago, Jen McLaren is president Donna DeSillis is Vice President, Bev Grazioli, Secretary, Wayne Simpson is Treasurer. And now we're ready for worship.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion, that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hey, everyone. It's children's time, so I say hello to you, children of God. You are in the right place. It's children's time. And so today we're going to be talking about Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. And it's Jesus is teaching in the temple and something really amazing happens while he's teaching. But before I get to that, I'm going to have you imagine something in your mind's eye. Our prop today is not something that I'm going to hold up, but something that you're going to imagine. And this is what I'd like you to imagine. I want you to imagine something messy in your house. It might be your bedroom floor where your clothes got dropped. Or maybe it might be your toys that are scattered all over the, the family room floor. Maybe it's those pile of wires behind your computer that you don't look at very often and you know it's just a whole myriad and a bunch of snake wires and they're kind of dusty because nobody wants to touch it because we don't want to mess up the computer at all. So imagine something messy that's in your house. Also, you might want to imagine something that's messy inside of your head. Have you had some thoughts recently that just weren't the best? Maybe you were thinking mean thoughts about someone just because you were mad at them or how mom just doesn't understand when we know moms understand everything. So I want you to imagine that thing, that item for a moment. I want you to keep that in your head. If you have more than one messy item, awesome. Imagine those things in your head. I want to tell you a quick story. And this comes from a play. It was written by William Shakespeare. And it's the story of Macbeth. And in this particular scene of Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, she's in the castle and she's walk, she's sleepwalking at night and she's done something horrible. And she feels that the thing that she's done so horrible is like a stain or a spot on her reputation. And so she's sleepwalking and she says, out horrible spot, out. And I want you to imagine those two things because now we're going to talk about Jesus in the temple. So Jesus is te teaching in the temple. And as he's teaching, the people are just really feeling the vibe. They really clearly understand what Jesus is teaching about. And during his teaching, a man stands up and he starts shouting at Jesus and he shouts really unkind things to Jesus. But Jesus recognizes that what's happening. He realizes there's a demon inside of the man making the man say all of these unnice things. And he says, out, horrible demon, out. And with that, the demon leaves the man's body. 
and everyone's just amazed at the power of Jesus, his authority for how he teaches, and his ability to recognize that there was an unclean demon in the man's heart and able to get him out. That's pretty amazing. So let's go back to your imagination now. And in your imagination, you have something, you're visioning something that is messy inside your house or maybe in your, your, your thoughts or both. Well, Jesus has that power. So when you have like some messy thoughts going on inside of your head, Jesus has the, has the power to help clean it up. No different than when your mom says, clean up your toys, make your bed, clean up your bedroom. You know you have the power to do that. So how does Jesus have the power to clean up what's going on inside of our thoughts and in our hearts? Well, he does it first with the cross. You'll remember he goes to the cross and in the cross, he forgives all of our sins. The other thing that happens is God sends the Holy Spirit and he sends the Holy Spirit to us. And just when we need to make that right decision to do something better than we were going to do it, and that's our conscious talking, and we can make that better decision. Or we can say, hey, you know what? I'm really sorry. I was really sorry that I was not nice to you just now. I'll try better next time. And so please keep that in mind. Inside of all of our messy worlds, there comes Jesus to clean it all up, to clean up what's inside of our heart, to clean up what's inside of our thoughts. And so all this we lift up to God in his most holy name, all this we pray in God's holy name and amen and yay, God. Just a quick announcement. Sunday school is today at 1115. I can't wait to see you there. Be in the right place. We're going to be learning about this particular gospel passage and what, what it means for Jesus to be an authority. The first reading is from the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever see the great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Holy wisdom, holy word. Psalm 111. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright, in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. The second reading is from the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, 
and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and from whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Holy Wisdom, Holy Word. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. Standing in awe of the divine sovereign is the beginning of wisdom. Ah, reverential respect, wonderment. Those of us who have faith in the triune God, who trust in Jesus the Christ, stand in awe at the creator redeemer, and sanctifier. And we often question how people without God, without faith, get through the trials of life. I've heard that many times since I was ordained. The other concern I've heard through the years is the focus of Pastor Peter Marty's article in the Christian Century this week. I'll paraphrase some of what Marty writes and add thoughts from Luther and some of my own. Marty writes of a conversation he's had hundreds of times, goes like this. Pastor, I don't know what we did wrong. None of our kids have any interest in faith or the church. They have no idea what it could mean in a time like this or how it could help ground their lives. I don't know what to do to help them. I've heard that many times too. 
Marty writes, first, it seems to me that understanding our lives as a daily gift is a significant part of discovering faith. This is different from appreciating life for its pleasures and joys or even reckoning with its pains and sorrows. To view life as a daily gift means there's a giver behind that gift. Otherwise, gift is the wrong word to use. When someone gives a gift, especially one that exceeds all deserving, the most appropriate response is gratitude. What may not be apparent to people inclined to dismiss faith is that genuine gratitude always has particularity. Being thankful in general is like being married in general. It makes no sense in the abstract. Someone has gifted you with today and that someone is not you. Second, for many people who dance around the edges of faith, I often sense that they spend more energy trying to please God or be good for God than acknowledging their need for God. We can't find God unless we know our need for God, writes Thomas Merton. How blessed are those who know their need for God, says Jesus in some translations of Matthew's Beatitudes. God is a blessing, not a crutch. It's easy in a world of material comfort to confuse what we truly need with what we want and can so readily acquire, at least for many of us in the ELCA. Finally, I'm more convinced than ever that a desire for God is the beginning of faith. We think a relationship with God is everything, but I wonder if that desire for the relationship isn't as sweet as the relationship itself. As I think back on my own experiences of falling in love, the desire was as beautiful as the relationship itself. I thirst for God, for the living God. My soul thirsts for God, the psalmist says. Deep into his ministry, St. Paul says something similar. I want to know Christ, not I already know Christ. Instead of defining ourselves by what we have or know or do, maybe we ought to think about what we most desire. The essence of a relationship with God is desiring God. I don't know if I can create desire in other people. But the longer I'm a pastor, the more convinced I am that instilling commitment in others is not my job. My job is to help stir up and notice longings for a life in Christ. To paraphrase the German mystic Meister Eckhart, if your kids can't feel this longing, all you can do is long for the longing in them. Martin Luther put it this way in the small catechism in his explanation of the third article of the creed. I believe that by my own understanding or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But instead, the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, made me holy, and kept me in the true faith just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and makes holy the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one common true faith. Daily in this Christian church, the Holy Spirit abundantly forgives all sins, mine and those of all believers. On the last day, the Holy Spirit will raise me and all the dead will give and all the dead, and will give to me and all believers in Christ eternal life.
this is most certainly true. Dear siblings in Christ, we are strengthened in our faith by the community of the believers in times of struggle or sorrow, including a pandemic now in the second year that has sickened over 25 million and killed over 425,000 in this country alone. We need one another. Even though we cannot yet safely gather in our nave, we know we are praying for one another and staying connected with calls, notes, or FaceTime. Now that the vaccine is out and there is a plan to get more vaccines distributed, the end of the nightmare is near. Dawn is on the horizon. Until that day when most of us are vaccinated, the infection rate decreases considerably and fewer people are dying, we will continue to worship virtually and safely together. So we will, with the psalmist, praise the Lord. We will say, yay, God, for the blessings, the gift God has given us. We will give thanks to the Lord with our whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. The works of God's hands are faithful and just. In the Psalm we hear, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. This is most certainly true. Amen. God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ throughout the world, prophets, teachers, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders, for the church and its ministries, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all God's works in creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources and all that exists, let us pray. 
Have mercy, O God. For government and leaders, cities and nations, rescue professionals and legal aid attorneys, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well-being of civil society, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those living with HIV AIDS, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless, and all in any need, especially those afflicted with or recovering from COVID-19, for caregivers, hospice workers, and home health aides, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the concerns of this congregation, those who travel, those absent from worship, those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, for the people of God in this place and for all other needs in our community, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For Bishop Bartholomew and our call committee as they look for the pastor God is preparing for St. Paul's, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism and thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord, especially Mildred, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people spoken or silent for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your son, Jesus Christ, our savior. Amen. We have been blessed at St. Paul's with abundant resources for ministry, our members and friends, our building, and our financial stewardship. Thanks be to God. Please send your offering to the church office or make it online. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, receive these gifts at you, as you receive us, like a mother receives her child, with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend others with this same love through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Whose birth among 
Yours the gold and yours the silver, yours the wealth of land and sea. We part stewards of your bounty, held in solemn trust will be. Come, O Christ, and reign among us, King of love and Prince of peace. Hush the storm of strife and passion, bid its cruel disasters or cease. By your patient years of toiling, by your silent hours of pain, quench our fevered thirst of pleasure, stem our selfish greed of gain. Son of God, eternal Savior, source of life and truth and grace, word made flesh whose birth among us hallows all our human race. By your praying, by your willing, that your people should be one. Grant, O oh, grant our hopes fruition, here on earth your will be Thank you for worshiping with us today. Go in peace. Be the light. Thanks be to God.